welcome back to What's New with Mead. We are in episode number 37, and I have Texas Longhouse Mead, who's a YouTuber, mead maker, and just a, a very faithful friend to the channel here to chat and talk about his mead making experience, which is, um, he has a lot of experience and just everything he does. So um, I'm gonna call you Carlos because I feel like that's a little more official. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, how's it going? So um, l tell us about your YouTube channel. Well, uh, my YouTube channel is small. You know, I've only been out for a year or a little over a year. Uh, it's just because when I started out, it was just, there wasn't a whole lot. At least I couldn't find a whole lot, you know, besides a year, one of the big ones that I found. Uh, it wasn't actually until after a while that I found uh, – doing the most and uh but i was like i was like man i wanted to provide better information based off of my experiences and what i had gained and help further the meat community so i was like you know what i'm gonna go ahead and start a youtube channel yeah well it's funny you say small because i mean comparative to other people sure but i I was looking back, this is probably six months ago. I was going back through my like beginning when I first started posting things and it, it took me six to nine months to get to like 75 to hundred subscribers. And so I understand that like it's a grind, but what I like about your channel is you're so much more informative than I was when I first started <laughs> and your video quality is so much better. Like everything about yours is way more polished. Um, and I, I personally think you'd, need more people. And so of course I'll be, I'll be putting uh, Texas longhouse meat or Carlos down below in the description if you want to su uh, subscribe to him, but your channel is a plethora of information and I really enjoy the stuff you put out. So uh, kind of on that note, I do want to ask you, what are some of the like, oh, well, I, I don't, how do I say this? I have certain things I'm really passionate about. Are you passionate more about testing of recipes, about A-B testing? Are you passionate about mead reviews? What What's your passion? Uh, for me, it's like my, my passion is one, I, I, you know, trying to perfect a recipe. I think that's what we all try to strive for. Uh, but that's why, like, every, like almost every recipe I do, you know, the, small, the smallest batch I'll make really is, is a gallon. But... In, re in reality, the smallest batch I make is three gallons because I split them up and then try. So it's all based on the same recipe, but with then with different adjuncts, you know, like the my chocolate boche or my oak boche, acer gland. You know, I have it split up to where I got a gallon of the boche acer gland that's on Hungarian oak, a gallon that's on American oak, and then. Uh, Last year, the year before, I made a chocolate boche. Well, this year, I'm making a chocolate Acer Glen boche. So I got another half gallon uh, just because I've already done chocolate. So I kind of know what it does, but I just want to see how it plays with maple syrup. So you know, yeah. that's why I, that one's only a half gallon. But so I, I like the testing of different adjuncts based off of the same recipe. And then also like one of the things that I'm starting to go in the direction of is, you know, I'll, I'll scour the forums and the Facebook groups, discords, and, you know, someone's like, Hey, you know, what's a good recipe for this? Or what's a good recipe for that? You know, like my banana one, everyone's all like, Hey, you know, use banana this way, use banana that way, use banana this way. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try all three, put it out in the video and let, you know, that way I can give my information, but like, Hey, this is what worked. This is what didn't work. And so basically that like, that's the direction I'm going in that I find myself going in is, nine ways to skin a cat let's put it all together for one and mm -hmm. you can decide as a viewer i want to try that one yeah no that's like what people do i mean when i think you do the same thing when we start making mead one of my things i recommend to people is to make a big batch of traditional and then split it for your recipe for your uh, fruits or your whatever other additions that way you're really uh, getting lots of options i mean of course people want to have six gallons of what pineapple mead but it's also good to start testing and see what blueberries do and whatnot. Yeah. So now I do want to backtrack a little cause you have talked about previously um, in just then even using chocolate in brews. Now mm -hmm. I personally have only done it one way and that was taking just 
uh, cacao nibs or cocoa nibs. I never know how to say the word, but um, putting them just straight into the brew, most of the time in secondary. You have a different method though. What is your method of of introducing them? You did some things before. Yeah, I'll I'll take them uh, depending on where you get them from because some are already toasted. And so... I'll kind of soak, you know, if they're lightly toasted already, I'll soak them in some water just to kind of see what they'll, what kind of flavors will impart and to see if it comes off oily in the water. Because if it does, then I'll toast them a little bit longer so that way there's not like a skim or a film of oil on top. And then so I'll toast them for about 10, 15 minutes. You know, you know it's getting good when the whole kitchen house is starting to smell like fresh chocolate, melted chocolate. Yeah. And that's Are you flipping them, them in that process? Are you like actually taking... Because, I mean, they have sides. Are you having yeah. to? Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll sit there, you know, like a chef does and just keep flipping the pan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, just because, one, you know, the oils, I, I have found out that if you let them sit too long on one side, the oils will actually burn the cacao nibs. So I'm like, oh, so you got to keep uh, moving it. Yeah. Um, and so, but if you do it in the oven, it's actually not that bad because it's coming from both sides. Whereas, you know, if you have it directly over heat, uh, it, it, it'll burn really quick, but the oven yeah. works really good. Um, I just prefer the stovetop because I can actually stand there, watch it, smell it, and see <laughs> see the process. enjoy it more. <laughs> yeah, and so toast them ten fifteen minutes, and then as soon as as soon as they're done, I'll take I'll take them off, put them on like a paper plate or a glass plate, so that way they stop the heating process and cool down, and then you know spray a hop sock toss them in there and put them in the yeah. brew. So um, do you have any preferred, like if anybody wanted to use it, is there a, a amount per gallon you would suggest, or do you think it's all based off of what you want? It, it's based off of what you want. If you're, you know, if you're looking for just, you know, just a subtle, you know, kind of an afterthought chocolate that comes through something that's not overpowering, it's about half an ounce per gallon. Okay. Uh, but, it, you know, some people are, uh, like my wife, she doesn't lo- she doesn't love chocolate. You know, she she likes chocolate, but she doesn't love it. So she wants she only wants like a little bit of chocolate. So mm-hmm. if you want a, a good strong chocolate flavor, then it's about an ounce per gallon. Uh, and then just let them sit for about a week, and then taste it. And if it needs to sit longer, you let it sit longer. Yeah, yeah. I um I want to do another. I want to use them more in general, cocoa or cacao nibs in general, but I have done a a, um, chocolate boche before, like you're mentioning, and it's a really fun flavor profile to mix. And I think it ages really well too. I have a bottle, actually I just saw it the other day. It's probably two or three years old now. And I'm very curious to see how it's developed. It's obviously like super desserty. You know, you're not going to drink it like 95 degrees on your porch. You know, it just doesn't seem like, like a summertime thing. It's more like after dinner, probably more wintry season, but it's definitely an interesting combination to play with. Yeah. So you also mentioned talking about your bananas uh, test. You had this three way banana, right? I I think you call it three way, three version banana experiment. Can you elaborate on that one a little bit more for us? Yeah. Um, Basically, you know, again, I was scouring the, the, I think it was just, cruising through the Facebook groups and somebody asked about banana and, you know, I had like maybe the week or two before that I had a uh, moonlight meteries. Uh, what's it called? Uh, it's banana foster. Mon- I thought that is no, oh. they're, they're a uh, monkey bread, which is a banana uh-huh. mead, banana bread uh-huh. mead or whatever. And I was like, Oh, I want to do a banana. And as soon as that one came up, I was like, Ooh, and everyone's like, oh, try it this way, try it that way. And th- this was actually the first time I actually worked with banana. So I was like, you know what? We're all going to learn together. And so, <laughs> and so I was like, all right. And, you know, so I was reading through all the comments, you know, and there's a lot of knowledgeable people out there. You know, there's still stuff that I haven't worked with that, you know, I, I would like to. You know, and again, banana, that was the first time I did banana. So I was like, you know what? All right. So, again, there's a lot of knowledgeable people there. You know, everyone's made it before, you know, and there's, like I said, there's, you can skin something a hundred different ways, you know, so let's, let's try them and see what actually works out. So, you know, the first one, you know, I, first thing I read was, Oh, you, you know, take the bananas, boil them in some water and it'll extract the sugar. So I was like, 
that makes sense. Uh -huh. They do it, do it with when they're doing it with corn. And so I was like, all right. And so uh, threw them in there, 30 minutes, cooled it down. Actually, on the video, I was like, yeah, I messed up because the the water was still hot when I threw the practice kids. <laughs> Don't do that. And then uh, the second one is you just take bananas, throw them in, in the fermentation process. And the third one is you just make it traditional and then throw bananas post-fermentation. And so I did that, you know, and the banana water, like, well, they were both, all three of them were fermenting or the two that had the banana during fermentation, uh, the water and full banana in there. Uh, it smelled just like banana bread in there. I was like, all right, this is, this is kind yeah. of good. Uh -huh. Well, the banana water came out then, you know, it, was, it had lacked in the mouthfeel, stuff yeah. like that. The banana in fermentation uh, had more mouthfeel than the, the water did. Uh, but it was it, it was still missing something, and of course, then the banana post fermentation you know had the mouthfeel had you know the sweetness from the banana. Uh, but I'm actually gonna redo that video, not necessarily redo it, but I'm gonna make another video where you know this is the recipe, and it's the recipe I've been anybody who's been asking about banana meats, whether on the Discord groups, the Facebook groups, uh, yeah. or like hey, you know what's the best banana? I'm like this is what I found is. So I'm gonna make another video on it, but you know, kind of give you all the download on it. Is you take your two pounds banana per gallon, uh, boil them down, put another two pounds per gallon in fermentation, and then another two pounds per gallon post fermentation. Uh, and uh, I, you know, if, if you like cinnamon, uh, I threw a, a Ceylon cinnamon, sweet cinnamon stick. Uh -huh. Threw it in there. Threw it in there for a month. Uh, some, you know, some people are like, oh, that's gonna, you know. Ended up being two gallons, that I, and I only use one stick for a month. It, it added just enough tannins that it balanced the sweetness, the tannins, and then you get the cinnamon that comes in and plays really nice because you know mm. one stick, so it doesn't overpower everything. Um, but yeah, that's that's the way I. That for, sounds that for, sounds really good. For at least me, that that's my official banana recipe. So yeah. And then, you know, I took it over. I took two bottles over to a buddy's house last night, and that was the first. Well, that and uh, the Bosha Acer Glen, those two bottles disappeared quick. <laughs> so I've only done banana, I've done it twice. I've done a strawberry banana mead like three years ago, and I, I did uh, what I did. I just cut up like two or three bananas and then threw it in. So the end result of that was like not super. I mean, not really super banana flavored, honestly. It just wasn't very strong. I did a um, banana and nutmeg mead for the Candy View Mead series. And I did something like, it was like six or seven bananas for the gallon. I don't remember how many pounds that was. But I froze them. They basically turned into mush. And then I just threw, I threw that into a, a bag, which, I mean, how effective was that? And then I put the bag into the brew. So... I think that one, the banana was still pretty light, but mm -hmm. your experimentation is super interesting because banana is a hard flavor to get. It's pretty delicate. And oh, yeah. that's why, you know, you're saying two pounds per gallon in three stages. And so, you know, that's six pounds for the gallon. That's a lot of fruit, but that just shows, shows how delicate it can be. You kind of have to, you have to know how to play well with it instead of just throwing it in like I've done. <laughs> so. Um, so is there any other kind of on that same note, is there any other flavor like bananas that that's delicate or something like that, that you've found that is hard to work with any other fruit, any other spices? Is there any other flavor profile that you're like, I, I want to do another three way w with, um, the next, the next, I guess, three way you can call is, uh, that I want to do is actually coconut, ah. uh, like toasted coconut coconut water slash milk everyone's like oh you gotta use coconut milk i'm like ah, it just seems kind of weird it seems weird yeah <laughs> and then uh the third one would just be just regular untoasted coconut so yeah um i've always heard with coconut water in milk that people have done it and they've been like yeah that was, that was not very good only because i guess it probably has a different reaction to yeast i don't really know i don't know 
but like one thing I'm going to look into because I, I I do a lot of reading and research and like I'm that I'm that weird guy like when I really want to get into something uh -huh. I'll, I'll actually look up like research papers and white papers and like <laughs> oh. read through them. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's hardcore. Dang, so. that's great though. That means you you know what you're talking about and know what you're doing whenever you get to that point. That's that's yeah. awesome though. I need to I probably need to be better about that. I'm more um, you know I'm like oh I don't know anything about papaya i'm just gonna like throw a ton of papaya in and like not really read too much i'm just gonna do it so probably yeah. need to do more reading like do more so far yeah so far the one thing that i found with like coconut water is like the ph issue mm. from from is it it's pretty from basic, what i got right? yeah and so mm -hmm. like it you know yeah during the fermentation and adding honey you know it'll make it more acidic but the but the coconut water is more uh, it's alkaline than it is acidic. And so mm. a little bit more than water at least. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it throws the pH, you know, with, you know, with me, do you want it between what is it, like 3.3 and 3.6, something like that for like a good healthy fermentation. Yeah. Uh, and from, from what I found is like, when you when you add everything together and try to ferment it, it's usually around like almost closer to five. Oh, so okay. I don't know if I don't know if it has to, you know just have to adjust the pH in it. I don't know if like I'm still looking into it before mm -hmm. I do it. And so it's all right. You know how were they fermenting it? Did the you know because honey's a little bit more acidic. So did the, you know what kind of acidic profile did they use to try to get it down to fermentation range or whatever? So. That, that part I'm still looking into before I do this. But. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So uh, when I first started, I, I had read people talking about, you know, pH balance and, and all those things. And honestly, that stuff scared me to start. And in some respects, I, don't, I still don't dive super deep because it's just, it's like a, you know, there are some things in mead making that you dive a little deeper, but you're not like going head in, like you have to do a million things to figure it out. pH is like, I feel like you have to try it, do a ton of testing to really understand it. Yeah. So um, I would love to spend more time adjusting pH balance. I think it'd be fun to do like a side-by-side -side brew and have just basically change the pH to be different things, you know, and see how yeast react. Yeah. Just kind of prove the point, like yeast still do respond to pH balance, um, contrary to what we might want to think. So yeah. that seems like a fun test. I could also see you doing that test too, because you're you're of that science mind, kind of like <laughs> me, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Okay, so I want to know. Uh, I'm gonna kind of do this backwards. Normally, I, I I start by getting to know you and us talking about like when you first started, but I'm gonna work my way backwards a little bit. Um, what are you talked about per, uh, perfecting a recipe and kind of that being your one of your big goals? What is a recipe that you are actively trying to perfect and or you have you feel like you've already perfected in some fashion? That you don't have to tell us the exact recipe, you could just say what you know, blueberry, pomegranate, or whatever. Like almost almost everything I do, uh, every time I do it the next time, I'll always take like, you know, I have a big fifteen gallon fermenter that, you know, like I, I do my mixed berry in, you know, everybody here, like all my friends here, like, dude, you need to get another mixed berry going. So, <laughs> yeah. And it, it's, it's literally like almost every three, four months, I got 15 gallons of a mixed berry going, you know, yeah. especially during, uh, during the spring and early summer when, you know, the strawberries are fresh, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, uh, cause I use all those. And then, uh, and so, like the first time I did it, it was good. You know, you know, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a competition winner, but it also, you know, wasn't one I had to dump down the drain. You know, uh -huh. everybody liked it. You know, free booze is free booze. But then every time I made it after that, I changed the ratios of the berries to, to see which way would give a better flavor. And then, now I found okay. You know, if I use blueberry juice in the fermentation. You get the blueberry base, and then you add your fruit on top, and then so you can play with it that way. And then, then I started for like the winter. I started oaking some, 
Mm. Uh, matter of fact, I sent one of those to uh, the meat stampede. Uh, yeah. Got a 30, 32 or 34 on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, which isn't bad. You know, like I said, it's, it's, it's still one of that just because the berries, you know, it's either hit or miss. You either nail the, the acidity and sweetness balance or those berries just like, hey, we're going to be acidic today. So, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, um, but then again, it also depends on the time of summer because, like, right now, you know, we're in, in the hundreds here in Dallas. And so, you know, I have the my lemon drop lemon hydro mouth, and it's a little bit more acidic. But, you know, when you're out on the water, out on the lake, it's just something about it seems it's almost like drinking lemonade out in the hot sun. You're yeah. Like, oh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so, yeah. Lemon, lemonade's acidic and sweet. And so, um, I think the time of the year plays into a lot of it, but going back to your question. Uh, so try to, I'm trying to perfect my, my mixed berry. I'm always, you know, like, like I said, I, I'll make 15 gallons. I'll pull like three gallons off to the side and I'll add, you know, all right, this gallon, we're going to add, you know, some extra vanilla bean, this gallon, we're going to add, you know, some nutmeg, this gallon, we're going to add, you know, something else. And then, all right, you know, which one came out better? And I'll take it to my friends. Hey, here's the original. Here's the ones that I'd made additions. Which ones do you like better? Oh, this one. And so the next time I make it, I'll make the 15 gallons with those additions that everybody liked. And then I'll pull three gallons off again. I'm like, all right, now let's add a little bit of something different to each of them. Oh, ah, okay. So but that's that's my pro- I do I do my perfection in stages as opposed to like, all right, you know, let's add these three ingredients and see how it turns out. No, I do it one at a time until I get to where I'm going. Yeah. No, and, I think that's awesome. I, I like that you, like you have a panel of friends that you could take that to. Like, that's so nice to be able to do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I'm assuming these people are like, like you said, free booze is free booze. So some of them I'm sure are like, Oh, it's free booze. Great. But I'm sure that a few of those people are like hi- more hypercritical to say like, Hey, that one was weird. That was really good. You know, and kind of be yeah. more honest. And like a lot of them too. Um, Cause we do our, Sometimes it's monthly and other times it's quarterly in my homebrew club. And, you know, for me, like I always recommend people, oh, you know, because, you know, I've had people like, hey, if I send you something, you try it. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll try it. You know, do you really want to spend the money? Or I'll, I'll recommend to them, hey, join a homebrew club because they're critical about their stuff too. So if you want honest opinion, join a homebrew club. Because they know what it feels like to, hey, I need honest feedback. What do you think? All right, cool. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So that's the standard. That's, that is, um, I definitely want to push people that way too. If you are able to join a homebrew club um, around local to you, it is so valuable. Um, and it's fun. I mean, it's people who understand your struggles. I think a lot of times, you know, you probably have friends who don't do any homebrewing. And the moment you start yeah. talking about it, they're like, and eh, they zone out, you know, cause they're like, <laughs> they're like, I have no idea what the Lalvin D47 is. I don't understand anything about this. Like, I don't care. But yeah. when you can go to somebody and be like, man, my K1 B1 packet just sucked. Did yours, you know, whatever. And you can kind of go like that. It's like, it's yeah. a extra nerdy thing, but I think it's very, very important. Yeah. I had a question about your, so you're talking about mixed berry. Um, do you smash your blueberries? Do you juice them? Do you just put them in whole? Like I say blueberries. I'm really talking about all berries. Are you, are you just throwing them in whole? What, what's your method? Uh, my method is you know, I get, I try to find the freshest berries I can. Uh, a lot, a lot, you know, I go to the, the produce section to get my berries you know i know some people will go and get the ones that are already you know flash frozen or whatever because those are picked right off and then flash froze uh, but for me i like to actually pick up the bear like the packages of berries and smell them because you know the strawberries you can get some yeah. some strawberries you're like it, you can smell the sweetness and other ones you're like there's nothing there so mm-hmm. i like to you know hold them in my hand smell them and then, so I find the, the freshest ones I can, the sweetest smelling ones that I can, and then I'll bring them home, you know, like the strawberries, of course, I'll cut the tops off or whatever, you know, quarter them, and then I'll throw them in a bag, and uh, instead of, you know, just having a bag of just strawberries, a bag of blueberries, a bag of red, I'll take and mix them all together in a bowl, and then just dump them in a the bag, uh, 
throw them in the freezer. And then once they're in the freezer, uh, 24, 48 hours, you know, get nice, hard, solid, take them back out, let them thaw. And as they're thawing, I'll throw some pectic enzyme on top, let them completely thaw out. And then uh, once that's done, I'll throw them back in the freezer again. And then once I'm ready to use them, I'll pull them back out. And then that way, you know, get as much juice as I can. It helps break everything down. And of course, yeah, helps with the, the pectic haze. Yeah. No, I think, so I, I asked that because I am, um, I've done some stuff with berries, but most of the time I just, I honestly end up blending them more because I feel like it just kind of concentrates the flavor. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, inter- berries are interesting to use. Okay. So we just talked a little bit about berries and things. Now um, I do want to know, are you experimenting with lots of different kinds of honeys at this point, or do you kind of cater to one little varietal? Where do you land with that? Um, I, I experiment with a lot until like, I find a honey that I think plays well with a lot of different things. Um, you know, we got down here is a uh, Walker honey farms, like two hour drive for me. Oh, that's so I've, nice. I've, yeah. I've, I've driven down there and bought 12 different types of honey to try and, you know, make traditionals out of them, see what the flavor profile comes out of. You know, I'm, I'm always looking to try different honeys. So, uh, but there, there are some that I'm like, all right, this is, this is the honey that I'm going to use for these recipes now, just cause I like the way the flavor, I like the flavor profile it has. I like the, the, how it accents the the flavor of the overall main. So like the banana one, I used avocado. You know, I was, I was thinking about it either like wildflower or uh, what was the other one? Uh, clove. I was oh, like, yeah. all right, you know. But then I got the avocado blossom and just the way it fermented as a traditional, to me, it had like the pie spices. It had mm-hmm. uh, a good earthy maltiness to it. Um, it's real roasty. Like, yeah, I oh, like yeah. it a lot. Uh-huh. And so I was, I was like, that would be good for like the banana one because, you know, banana bread a little bit, you know, you get the the earthiness, the the pie spices and stuff out of it. So I was like, yeah, it's going to be good for that. And then, of course, the other ones, you know, it depends, you know, like my peach, I use Tupelo. You know, peach is delicate, Tupelo is delicate, and you can balance the two. It actually comes out really good. Um, what else have I used? Orange blossom. You know, everybody uses orange blossom. Uh, my favorite is Brazilian orange blossom. Oh. What's uh, the difference, in your opinion, between Brazilian and regular? Regular, quote. Uh, because I, like, I've, I've used California orange blossom, Florida orange blossom, Monterey orange blossom, and the Brazilian orange blossom. And the Brazilian has more of a tropical flavor to it, more tropical citrusy. Mm-hmm. Um, and overall, it... It it, it, pl- it tastes better when you know when you're trying to work with something like that, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think um, I I think it'd be really fun to play with a bunch of different same varietal of honey, but different location. Like I have a, a one of my dream videos projects is to get two to three pounds of of just clover honey from every single state, and. Mm do like a basically a one gallon batch and compare them all just doing like a traditional and just compare them and be like what is oregon uh you know clover honey taste against uh whatever montana you know you yeah. suddenly have all these different things i think it'd be a lot of fun it'd also be a ton of work <laughs> and a oh, ton yeah. of mead that's that's you know if i did them all at once which i probably would have to it's 50 you know 51 52 depending on how you look at it um gallon carboys so i don't know that i'm gonna do that anytime soon i probably need a (laughs) little bit bigger room before i can do that but it seems like a fun thing and obviously the uh, the terroir i I can't say the word but what they refer to in wine um as like your location essentially makes such a big difference for honey obviously because honey is all dependent on location um so you have You've got lots of different honey experience, and I, I think that's super valuable 
too, because understanding how to pair honeys with, with flavors, other flavors is like next level mead making. I think a lot of people see a recipe like the Joe's ancient orange or something like that. And might say, well, don't ever change it. Don't ever use anything else where if you change maybe one little thing about the recipe, you'll find that it actually creates a better product in the long run. Um, so I think people understanding what, not only what honey tastes like, but how to pair it with things really takes you to the next mean making level. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to know, like I said, we're working backwards. We're doing this in a weird way, but I want to know now kind of what are some, uh, you, you said you started your YouTube channel cause you wanted to be able to put out more content for people to watch and, and learn from. Um, what got you into mead making initially? What was your start there? Uh, one, one of the guys that I was friends with, uh, you know, he made, he was, he was making mead, uh, but it was, I call it the old ancient traditional way where, uh, he was using raisins and you know, <laughs> old, old twigs and leaves and berries yeah. and, you know, just, uh -huh. yeah. was he a wild yeast guy or is he, uh, he made, he made some with wild yeast. Uh, okay. he, he actually made quite a bit with wild yeast. Uh, but you know, if he didn't want to wait, you know, for the wild yeast colony to build up and get healthy, he would use regular yeast. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's, so he, he was like, Hey, you want to learn how to make me? And I was like, yeah, sure. And so I had nothing else to do. Uh, so he started to teach me how to make me and I was like, all right, you know, this is, like you can, you can make a decent product doing it the old traditional. Mm -hmm. you know, they've been doing it for thousands of years. And, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but as time has evolved, you know, it's time to start catching up with the times in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he, he, he showed me how to make mead and I was like, all right, cool. I want to, I want to make this better. So that's, yeah. th that, that was about five years ago. Okay. That's funny. So yeah, I, I always equate, um, you know, people talking about making it like a Viking. Um, I, I say that if Vikings had, if we told them, Hey, this fermate of oh, this powder can make your yeast like go faster and you have a drink that's better faster they would be like okay cool they wouldn't be like no never um yeah. but i also think it's it's like modern medicine you know we we continue to get better at modern medicine and and stuff so why would we not do more with modern technology education it'd be yeah. like if we never you know we still you know somebody has a uh, infection on their arm and instead of treating the infection they just cut off the arm it's like okay well we don't we don't do that anymore. That was like, you know, <laughs> 2000 years ago. Why would we keep doing that today when you have a way to fix it? So, mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, that's a whole nother rabbit hole of things, but I, uh, I like that. Like you were like, Hey, this is good, but let's, let's do more. That's pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, so what are some, you've told us a little bit over an overview of your channel. Um, what was like, what are some big projects that you are really wanting to tackle now? We talked about the three way, uh, other three way mead possibilities. What are some, yeah. some things you like are on your list of videos to make without spoiling? You don't have to, I don't want, want to say. Um, really, like I said, cause I'm, you know, cause you know, you have, you have your thing, uh, doing the most has his, you know, the other, uh, mead makers out there, they have their, direction that they go in and so like mine is now getting into all right you know somebody ask a question you know what's a good recipe for this and you get six different responses all right cool i'm going to take those six responses ah. and i'm going to test them and then i'm going to come back to you and be like hey for me this is what worked best you know because like the banana one everyone's like oh you know use the skins use the skins but when i was reading you know all the because a lot of bananas are actually imported, and so they're sprayed with insecticide and herbicide, mm. stuff like that, for transportation. I was like, 
yeah, you can rinse them and you know clean them off real good. It, it just you know, honey's expensive. Time comes and you don't get it back. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to use the skin. Um, so I made it without the skins. As my point of view, you know, and, and that's not to say it's the right way, the only way, or the wrong mm-hmm. way. You know, it's, you know, there's a million ways to do stuff. Again, yeah, you know, that's that's my that's my biggest thing that I tell everybody. They're like, oh, you know, what's the best recipe? Well, there's a million ways you can do things. Um, it just depends on what you're looking for, and so uh, that's that's kind of the direction I'm going. Is you know, I, I wish I. Yeah, I, I wish I had sent you my banana nutmeg one that I used because I used the skins in it. And um, I, you know, we talked about before, you do a little more research prior to videos. Uh, I, sometimes, like I said, I just throw things in and say, good luck. And um, <laughs> so I, I threw the skins in and then, you know, I started finding some information like that post adding the skins into that brew. And I was like, ooh, uh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. The skins definitely add a different flavor of banana. They add yeah. some weird kind of more tartness to it. Um, <laughs> and who knows, maybe that brew, I put something with pesticides in by accident. So I hope I didn't, but there's always a chance now. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I said, you know, a lot of people, it's not that they don't think about it. It's just not something that's commonly thought of. You know, because you'll see right. all the times, oh, I want to use dandelion or I want to use this. And they'll tell you, hey, if it's ever been sprayed with fertilizer or insecticide, don't use it. Uh-huh. But when it comes to fruit, they're all like, oh, yeah, cool. It's fruit. You know, you can eat it. Well, you don't eat the skin, so the banana. Right. And that That's what keeps the fruit inside fresh. So they'll spray the outside because nobody, nobody eats the outside. So mm-hmm. um, that was one thing when, because I guess I, I look, I try to research everything I can before I try something just to make sure I, I again, try to do the best practice for the modern uh-huh. times. And that was the biggest thing that came up was, you know, there's, because it almost, what do they say? It's like 85%, 90% is imported mm, bananas. Okay. And so, yeah. you know, it's sprayed to keep longevity and, uh, yeah. I, uh, I probably need to factor that into things I buy more. The thing, I I don't know what you have available in Texas, but as far as fruits and things like that, we don't have a ton of amazing, or I'll say, yeah, amazing fruit in general here in Oklahoma. It's just not a ton. I mean, Texas, you might get a little bit more, maybe. I don't really know. Depends on where you're at in Texas, of course. Yeah. Uh, Um, We we can actually get a lot of decent fruit up here. Um, But especially, you know, with like Whole Foods, uh, Aldi sometimes has some uh, interesting fruit that comes in. Yeah. Uh, what else? Just, you know, just like, Go ahead. Sorry. I mean, we, we also have like the Asian Mart up here as well. Oh, Indian, yeah. Indian, uh, or the Middle Eastern Mart. So we can, I can go there and get some yeah. off the wall spices. I'm like, oh, I'm going to try that. Yeah, you can get some really cool stuff at those places. I think people forget about, I'll call them smaller markets, but really they're not that small. You know, there's there's a lot of interesting fruit and spices you can get that's not just at Whole Foods or whatever. Um, so you are, you've talked about using like more juice in your brews. Um, do you ever juice your fruit or do you only buy fruit juice. <laughs> That's a weird way to say it, but do you ever like press your fruit to try and get the juice out or anything like that? Um, like if, if I'm using juice and I'll just buy the juice, like my, my blue or my mixed berry, uh, made my base. I use blueberry juice, mm-hmm. um, as part of the base and then throw a whole fruit on top of it. So I want to get into like, uh, uh, steam juicing or whatever, but yeah. yeah. All right. So I just, I had a, this is a silly thought in my brain, but I want to play uh, a little bit of a desert Island game when it comes to bean making. So, you know, desert Island, you can only take one thing. Yeah. What's your one yeast you're going to take? What's the best yeast that you would take if you only could take one? Now, uh, 
I'm, mm. I'm actually kind of getting really big into the uh, Kavak strains right now. Ah, which uh, one specifically do you like? Uh, I'm torn between the Lutra and Hornendal. Okay, yeah. I've used Lutra for... Well, might have been. I might have used Lutra for that. We, we were talking about the blueberry uh, hopped blueberry mead. I think I used might have used Lutra in that actually. Oh, okay. So yeah, those are really good. Um, I I am really enjoying uh, uh, Voss is nice, especially for people like us who end up going through the heat. Uh, oh. You don't have to worry so much about that. You know what's going to happen if my house gets super hot. You don't have to keep your your house as, as cool. Of course, there's every other brew in your house you want to keep managing, but you can budget a little bit more with Voss for sure. Yeah. Um, I had one more. So if you if you were going to only make one recipe from now on, would it be your mixed berry, or is there something else that you would that you would have to do? Like if you could only do one recipe. Oh man, that's hard. I know. Uh. Man, that that yeah, that's a that's a hard one because there, there's there's been several that I've been uh, I won't say perfecting, but definitely getting up there. Uh -huh. Like the like the second entry I sent to a meat stampede was my mango habanero, my hot mango habanero. Oh, uh, yeah. Did I, I uh, did I test test any of yours? Um, uh, no, my I name had, on your cards at all? No, I had Jake and no, not Jake. Uh, I had Rob and um, uh, maybe Nick the other. or Tony. Uh, man, I don't remember. Um, might have been Nick. I can't remember hundred uh, percent, but I remember, I remember Rob because uh, I said something on the Discord. And he's like, oh, I remember that one. I was like, <laughs> somebody remembered it. <laughs> so that's always a good feeling. But uh, yeah. yeah, my, my hot mango habanero, that one scored a uh, 43. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I and, probably ended up tasting that in the in our best of, mini best of show stuff we did. So yeah. um, I just can't remember it. We tasted a lot of mead then. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like I, f I feel for you guys on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was fun. It was fun, but it was definitely a gauntlet for sure. So, oh yeah. Um, but but as far as one I can make forever, it because like it's either it's either my hop lemon, my kawash here, which is the mixed berry, or that uh, mango habanero. So it, it, it it's hard. Hard to pick. Yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> Do you make anything other than meat at this point are you are you a beer guy do you make any wine uh well like i'll make braggots you know so uh -huh. kind of kind of beer um but other than that i'm just yeah. I'm, I'm strictly me yeah well so for, um, a lot of people don't know this about you because they don't always get to see your setup fortunately you're on the man made me discord and doing the most discord and I, I, you're probably on the meat hall you're on all the this yes has got discord stuff um you posted your setup quite a bit, and you have a very, very cool setup. You have a you have a keyser, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it's a it's a barback fridge that I converted into a keyser. I guess you can call it. It's a three tap, isn't it? Yeah. So you have that, which I already think is super cool. But then you also you posted some other parts of your equipment. You've got a, you've got a lot of really interesting. Um, Equipment, equipment that I think a lot of people want, like just behind to your, I think to your right, you have that conical furniture on oh, yeah. stainless steel, like cage, like that thing. I mean, people would kill to have that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. And if you, um, if you want to know what I'm talking about, you know, you can jump on the man made me discord and um, Carlos is actually uh, pretty integral to the survival of that because he helps me moderate it. But he also posts a lot of, um, stuff about his equipment and things. So if you want to see what I'm talking about, you can hop on there and find that. But I, I like your setup quite a bit. Um, you know, ever since you were so gracious enough to get me a kegging setup to start off my new venture in life, um, <laughs> I've, I've literally just dove super deep with it now. And I'm, I now have three kegs and I 
I'm doing another project with um, New Air, and so I'm I'm I have a chest freezer from them, and eventually I'll convert that to a, a keyser, a three tap keyser, mm-hmm. kind of like what what BC has. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's yeah yeah yeah, it's a good looking um, keyser. So I'm excited to kind of go further and further. Being able to keg is a game changer. Oh yeah, people always hardest- talked about it, and I I never understood until now. Yeah. For for me, the the hardest part, and I'm still in, you know, it, again, this is another reason why, you know, I'm thankful for y'all's discords is uh, bottling, bottling out of a keg. Uh, it's very tricky. It's uh-huh. finicky, depending on what style you go with. Because, like, I had the beer gun, and I've messed with the pressure. I've messed with hose length. I've messed with temperature. I, like, I've put everything in the fridge freezer so everything was cold like the beer gun the hoses like everything uh-huh. no matter what i can have the pressure down to two and it would still over foam and yeah. the keg the, you know the keg was carbonated at eight psi but for whatever yeah. reason it would still over foam i'm just like i don't get it and then uh dog stick fetch uh on the discord he's like oh yeah get this one and so now i have the the last straw mm-hmm. with the foamless finisher uh yeah. Getting that set up and, you know, making sure the seal is right when you first get it is tricky because you're like, oh, yeah, you just snap it and do this. But there's like a little slit, and if it's not sitting just right, it won't hold the pressure just right, so it's tricky. But once you get it set, it's yeah. good. So, yeah. And so for anyone that's, that's wondering, um, he's talking about like generally when you when you bottle into a uh, – from a keg to a regular beer bottle, you have a – a beer gun of sorts and it shoots it purges the bottle with co2 you can correct me because I've, I've never done this before i'm just going off of my like i said limited knowledge and then you fill up you're filling from the keg with this co2 purged and most of the time that leaves a little bit of foam on top that you kind of have to fight when it comes to capping and things no. but there's this thing called the last straw which basically just seals on the top of the bottle and then holds that pressure so there's no foaming and you just pull it right off and cap. And so mm-hmm. there's theoretically zero foam, right? Yeah. That's, uh, that's something I need to get. Cause I've been, my, my bottling off has been um, basically pulling a growler for people and then just like giving it to them. Yeah. And you know, most of the time I'm like, you probably need to drink this in like a day or two at max. So <laughs> um, it's not like a long term, but I'd like to be able to long term actually bottle off a keg. Yeah, when I get to that point, yeah, and sending like like the like the meat stampede that my mixed berry, uh, like the, one of the biggest things, like oh you know it's missing a little bit of mouthfeel, missing some of the, the acidity, um, and like I knew it was missing something. I was like I you know normally because now I ca- I carbonate them and it's ever since then like you said it's a game changer, you know, with CO two you had you had to make it just a little under acidic because CO2 actually adds acidity to it and the mouthfeel. But when I was making it still, I was like, it's missing something. It's missing something. What am I missing? Uh, I'm going to send it to them. They'll tell me what it's missing. And, and that's the feedback I got. It's like, Oh, it's missing some of the acidity. It's missing some of the mouthfeel. And uh, one of them was like, if it was carbonated, it would have been good. I was like, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah, oh, I should have done it. <laughs> that's funny. Oh man. So you're talking about acidity is one of those topics. Um, no, we're not talking about pH. We're talking about the acid mouthfeel in this case. Yeah. So have you, have you experimented much with like tartaric acid versus malic versus citric? Like in brews, are you a, uh, a acid blend kind of person? Like how do you deal with acid adjustments? Uh, for a while, I was just, you know, just a acid blend guy. I was like, oh, you know, need some acidity. You know, here's some acid blend. Uh, and that was, again, that's, like you were saying earlier, there's some holes you just dive deep into. Uh-huh. And when I first, when I first started, like, oh, okay, you need to do the acid balance. All right, you know, here's some acid blend. Oh, yeah, you know, everyone's like, oh, yeah, it balances everything out. It works great. You know, you get a little bit of everything. I was like, all right, cool, whatever. And then getting into the groups, like, well, just add citric acid because the tartaric acid does this and malic acid does that. And I'm like, hold on, what? What'd you say? <laughs> and so 
now I started going into it. So now I, I, I keep all three on hand. You know, I keep malic, tartaric, and citric acid. You know, I still have a little uh, acid blend back there. You know, if, uh, like if I'm like if I have something, I'm just like ah, uh, I don't know. Just throw a little bit of acid blend in there and just knock it back. Yeah, just to kind of get a general idea, as opposed to all right, let's try citric blend here, you know, uh-huh. tartaric here, malic here. Uh, okay, let's try this, this, you know, just to get a general idea of what the acidity is going to add to the mead before I go down that hole of, all right, now let's figure out which acid blend to go with. Yeah. Or which, yeah, no. which acid to go with. I like that step because acid blend, it is a good precursor to saying like, does this need acid in general? Yeah. And because most everything does, I think like Mead Stampede was really eye opening for me because it helped me understand the value of acid uh, acidity in that tasting experience to tannin or tannic feel to sweetness. There's like a little balance uh, balancing table that you have to hit with all three of those. And we had a lot of meads that were, you know, sweet and they were tannic. And you're like, okay, cool. But they didn't have like a little acidity to help push it forward. Or they were really acidic and tannic. And then they didn't have enough sweetness to balance. And so starting with acid blend, putting a little bit in and saying, okay, this needs some acidity in general. Then you can take, a, let's say, a, a small sample of, of it, split it into like three or four glasses. And if you have the acid, sprinkle just the tiniest bit of tartar- tartaric, sprinkle a little bit of malic in each one, whatever it is and taste test and see what does that malic acid do to affect the brew. And eventually you'll science it enough and go, okay, yeah, I need tartaric in this case because that citric was like way too bright or whatever. Um, yeah. But that is that is like next level. That's, that's a deep, deep hole of doing oh, yeah. this that is, is a bit overwhelming. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm close to, I, I think I just logged brew number 190 and I feel like I only just discovered that truth probably 40 or 50 meads ago so it's taken me a long time to get to that point but um it it is a, another game changer in how your product ends up significantly so I, I would i'd suggest anybody who can to get not only acid blend but also tartaric malic and citric and then start playing around with it because you'd be surprised at the changes each one add to the brew oh yeah um, okay, so I want to ask you now just a little bit more about your YouTube channel. Uh, you you kind of have – your style is very similar to mine in that you're documenting the process, essentially. And you know yeah. you're kind of uh, – in a, in a, not a great term, but vlogging the process. Now, your vlogging is not just like, you know, typical style, hold your phone up like this, but it is it is like a very honest – look into what you're doing. And I like that quite a bit. Yeah. And um, I, so I guess my question is, are you, well, I was watching your, your Boche Acer Glen video earlier and I, I see you're doing, you are kind of keeping us updated on things. Is there any brew you have currently going that um, is at a standstill? I don't know a better way to say that. So I have lots of things that I'm like, that people are waiting on, but I'm like, it's not ready for the world to see. Is there anything in your world that like you're just holding on to before you show? Uh, right now, no. Um, like I, I, one of the reasons my channel is kind of like limited on videos is because uh, I was I was going to college. I just I just finished my degree, so now I have a bunch of time to where I can start making videos and start getting stuff out there. Yeah. Um, and so there's going to be a lot more videos coming, you know, especially now that I'm, now that I have the time and nothing else to do. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm definitely going to be hitting the forums. You know, if anybody wants to play, Hey, what kind of recipe, you know, either, you know, send me a message over, you know, like I'm on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Hey, I'm looking for this recipe, you know, try it out, you know, or just ask on one of the Facebook groups and, I'm sure I'll see it because I'm in pretty much all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, you know, just see what kind of responses get back. And uh, especially if it's like at least three different uh, 
variations, I'm more than happy to be like, all right, we're going to try this. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, pretty much like right now is that just that, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redo my official banana meat recipe. So that one, mm-hmm. that one is, that one's in the works, uh, but it's going to be from start to finish. And then the, the Boche Acer Glen, I'm just kind of keeping updated as I go along, just so that way I'm trying, still trying to put something out. And I'm like, all right, y'all got to wait. Mm-hmm. And, of course, and then, of course, the big big project we're doing, uh, that one. <laughs> Jeez, sorry. That's all right. Sorry. I got two giant Great Danes. Oh, I've seen them. They're pretty, they're pretty fun. <laughs> All right, bud. Go lay down. Sorry about that. Oh, you're good. Um, I understand. Uh, what was I saying? So oh, you got, so- we got, we have a project we're working on too. I mean, I actually, um, I need to move on to the next step of that one today. I got to go buy some, some stuff to keep going with that one, but that's an interesting one as well. Um, so I do want to kind of mention that one, not going into detail necessarily, but we have a, a big project, uh, a meat project that is as, Carlos and myself, BC with doing the most in essentially all of the great mead making YouTube channels that are out there, um, all collaborating on a one mead recipe. And we're all putting our, our flares on it. And I think it's, it's pretty exciting because we all have different styles and I think the results are going to be very fun. Some people are going to have really simple things. Some people might have crazy things. Mine is going to be kind of weird, I would say, but um i'm excited i don't know what you're gonna do with yours but uh i have no doubt that it'll be interesting yeah it's it's getting there it, yeah miss I, I didn't mess it up uh, <laughs> yeah i uh I, I forgot to stabilize it and i added uh added something to it and it started fermentation again i was like oh, oh. <laughs> that's one thing I, I am horrible at is marking which meat I stabilized, which one hasn't been. Yeah. And was it uh, last week I, I moved 35 gallons of meat around mm. uh, and I was stabilizing the different ones. And I'm like, I lost track of which one I stabilized and which one I didn't stabilize. I was like, uh, all right, I think I did. So, <laughs> so I got to get better at marking them or doing something. Yeah. With them. You just need like a sticker, get like a sticker. You can put on everything. They'll think you stabilized. I put, uh, like I try to, I'm bad at it too, but when I stabilize, I'll put, I just put stab and then I put the date that I stabilized it. So then I'm looking at carboys going, Oh yeah, this has been stabilized. Cause I've done that before too. Um, it, and it's always fun when you're like, Oh, this is re-fermenting again. That's fun. I I guess I didn't (laughs) do what I was supposed to do. So, but good thing is you didn't, bottle it so it's uh you know that could have been a a way different problem oh yeah so So, luckily i've only had one one bottle and it only blew a cork out ah yeah um, but yeah my wife i've had uh i've had one of those i what 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 was it it was something i had pasteurized but i didn't pasteurize it for long enough and so it ended up like there was just a few yeast left in there that were like the last soldiers and they, they went and started going again. And I didn't think about it for a while. And I was sitting in here one day and all of a sudden I hear and it like cork goes flying. <laughs> Luckily it wasn't like a gushing, you know, huge mess, but I was like, Oh, that's, that's not good. So, yeah. okay. So I want to finish our time by asking you what are some, uh, what's some sage wisdom you would impart on any brewer who's new to this world? What are some things you wish you had known or just things in general? Uh, I, we pretty much covered it really, you know, do your research before, you know, you, you do something, you know, there's a bunch of communities out there, you know, your discord doing the most of discord, the meat hall, you know, there's a Reddit subgroups, the, all the Facebook groups, you know, there's a lot of people out there willing to help. Yeah. Uh, just don't go into it willy nilly. Be like, Oh, I'm going to do this. Cause you know, there are some people out there that don't have the best practices. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I'm not going to name names. No, uh, you know, I, I, I 
try to support as many YouTube communities as I can. Any meat, you know, meat brewers, stuff like that. You know, there's just some you're like, mm, you shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Uh, but get out, ask somebody, especially even if it's something you're not sure about. Uh, and like I tell everybody who wants to get into meat, start with the traditional. Understand traditional, in my opinion, is one of the hardest things to make. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to hide your flaws, you know. So you, you'll be able to learn a good process for meat making, and then you can build upon that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, again, there's more than one way to do stuff. So look it up, find what you prefer to do. Uh, and like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, your friends are good people to go to, but then again, free booze is free booze. So, you know, find yeah. You know, find people who are like-minded, who actually want to help you better yourself. And so, you know, join a homebrew club, join, you know, find somebody who's local to you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's all great. And um, I, I said that was my last question. Here is actually my last question. You just mentioned <laughs> traditionals as the starting point. And I agree, 100%. If you make your first mead, it is uh, always a lot of people want a recipe to go off. So they'll go and find a, you know, blueberry, whatever meat recipe. That's, that's fine. But a traditional will help you understand honey more than fruit and spices. So post traditional making that we have some, uh, I'm going to use the word stereotypical meat recipes that people suggest stuff like the Joe's ancient orange braised one month mead, uh, Viking blood, like the ones that are standards. Um, of those options, which of those would you suggest for somebody to make after a traditional, if they were had to make something that was a stereotypical meat recipe? Um, that one, that one's actually tricky for me because I've never done the was it, the the one month meat. I haven't done that. Yeah, and, I, haven't, I haven't either. But and I haven't done the ancient orange either, just because, like I said, the guy that. I, was teaching me how to make me was of that might not that there's anything <laughs> yeah. wrong. Yeah. Uh, again, like I said, you can make good stuff out of older ways. Yeah. Um, but because the way he taught me and the, the direction I wanted to go, I'm like, hey, it's kind of the same thing he was teaching me to do that way. And that's yeah. not what I want to do. I want to make <laughs> things better. So I, yeah. I've never done the Joe's ancient orange. Um, You're not missing out. But I'll I, tell you that. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's what everyone says. Uh, that night, you know, it sounds horrible because a lot of people swear by it and think it's actually really good. But understanding the process, the modern process now of making me versus the way Joe's Ancient Orange is made, uh, it actually teaches, especially new brewers, because that's you know a lot of that's what that's what a lot of new brewers actually get into is Joe's Ancient Orange. Yeah, and as horrible as it is to say, that actually teaches some really bad habits. Yeah, which is why I'm like, I, it's not that I'm not, I won't promote it or won't do it or you know, like one day I plan on doing it just to be like, all right, here's my opinion of it. Yeah. Um, but it for somebody who's starting out, it it really it really teaches you bad practice. I guess you can yeah. say. Okay, so so then, habits, there you go. what would you suggest? What recipe would you suggest for somebody go to next? As like, if if traditional is level one understanding, what's level two understanding going to be? What's a good recipe you would suggest for someone to go to? Just a a basic one fruit meat. Mm -hmm. You know, because you know, once you start trying to blend fruits or whatever, like if you you know mixing berries is one thing, but if you're going to mix like, uh, oh, I'm going to do a or, you know, as a matter of fact, you can go from the traditional to a sizer. Simple. All you're doing is yeah. replacing the water with the apple juice and going from there. Yeah. It's not great. Because a, a sizer is also, one, a traditional is tricky to make. Not tricky. It's simple. But mastering is tricky. Mm -hmm. A sizer will teach you how fast a fermentation will go because uh, as a lot of people for the first time making sizers, will, like, you'll see it all the time. Oh, my sizer, I started it three days ago and it smells bad. What's well, the hydrogen sulfide? Because the apples, the apple juice will ferment faster than the honey. 
Mm-hmm. And so that'll get people to be like, all right, that'll get them, you know, that they'll start teaching you about Tosna, about, you know, proper degassing, especially uh, when you're doing your additions and stuff like that, and how off gas the off flavors, off aromas and stuff. So that's where I would go. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, one, a one fruit mead, whether it be Sizer or something else is a good start. Anything, uh, make your additions small. Don't go for the, th- the recipe that has 37 ingredients because yeah. that's just more ways to have something go wrong. And, uh, of course, that's never fun when you have to dump a brew. Um, so we don't want to do that. But, well, Carlos, thank you for chatting with us. I want to say I, I know you have – well, I could have asked – we could have gone for two hours and started talking because <laughs> I, I always have questions to ask. But um, I would love to do this again in the future because I think I'm, – I'm excited to see what videos you're going to come out with, and I'm sure we'll be able to chat about those in the future. But you have a wealth of knowledge that we have only just started to – uh, you know, scratch at. And I'm, I think everyone who wants to learn more from uh, Carlos is, needs to go check out Texas Longhouse Mead. He's on YouTube as Texas Longhouse Mead um, and Instagram. You, do, you don't do anything on Facebook though, right? I have a Facebook page, yeah. And usually like oh, that's where most of my brews end up. Like mm-hmm. the pictures of my brews that, you know, stuff that I want to make videos oh. of or stuff like that. Uh, stuff that you can see that I'm just doing randomly. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I have a, I have a Facebook page for Texas Longhouse Mead. So, you know, especially if you want to know something or you want to know my process on something that I'm making, that's the perfect place to ask. Cause you know, again, I got nothing else to do. So, you know, if you ask a question, I'm, I'll get back to you really quick. Yeah. And um, Carlos is also a, a big part of, at least the man made me discord. He is, uh, he's on there chatting a lot and helping me out. And so if you have a question and you want to meet with other mead makers too, go check out that, that'll be in the description, but, uh, there are lots of ways to connect with him. And uh, I want to say, Carlos, thank you for coming on and sharing your knowledge and, uh, letting us know about your YouTube channel. We want to support you as best we can. So everybody listening right now or watching right now needs to go and subscribe to Texas Longhouse Mead. That's the best way to support uh, creators is by subscribing. Um, it's one thing to view, but subscribing says, hey, I'm here. I'm here with you. So I want to push people your way. Carlos, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll chat again soon, but uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you have a good day. Cheers. Let's go. Cool.